We should get you guys to sing a cappella every week. That was just <laughs> awesome. I was down there and I could just hear this lovely wall of noise um, in tune and in perfect harmony with each other. It was just lovely. Boys and girls, it's time for you guys to head out towards Junior Church. As they're heading out, can I ask you please to turn with me to page 1188 of the Church Bibles. Today we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 through to the end of the chapter. Um, We need for God's help as we look at the Bible together, so let's pray and ask for that. Uh, Let's all pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank you that we can sing together about the Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you that your word is all about him. And we pray that as we consider the truth of your word now, we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would speak to all of us. Give us ears to listen to you and to obey you. Lord, please would you help me, help all of us to truly consider Jesus and specifically his suffering on a cross for us and why that's so important. Bless us, we pray. We pray too for the boys and girls as they head to junior church that you would speak and encourage them through what they do today too. Amen. Well, um, children, oftentimes out of their mouths come the most profound and insightful truths. I remember on one occasion um, watching um, in a church in the UK. I worked in a church in a place called Norwich. You would say Norwich. Um, And uh, there, um, there was the pastor, Keith, and his curate, like an associate pastor, uh, Mark. And they had two sons, both aged around about nine or ten, maybe a little bit younger, uh, Thomas and Jamie. And after a Sunday morning service, Jamie and Thomas decided that they were going to play church. And the pair of them stood at the front of the church building and sat where their dads normally sat, because it was an Episcopal church and they had sort of like praying pew type things for them to sit in and and kneel in. And the pair of them sat there and pretended that they they were dads. And the best bit was when Thomas came forward, Keith's son, um, and, and, and he stood at the front and he went, and now the sermon, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) It was hilarious. It was really funny. But here's the thing. There are times, and that's the issue for many of us, isn't it? We come to church, maybe we hear these things about Jesus, and that's kind of what we think. We hear them starting to talk about God, and we're going in our minds, blah, 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 blah. It's you know, it's like that Charlie Brown moment with the teacher, you know, the wah, 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 wah. We've talked about that before. And that's the response sometimes we have when we hear people talk about the Bible and specifically about Jesus. Um, The danger is that it creates a false disconnect. Uh, Today, we're continuing on our series in Hebrews chapter 2. I've given this the title, No Better Man. We're talking about the reality of who Jesus is. Because there are many of us, maybe in church, but many of our friends think of God as distant, or remote, or irrelevant, if he's there at all, and Jesus as weak and pathetic, belonging to some sort of stained glass window. And and, and maybe that's you today. Maybe maybe you're thinking and you're feeling that, that you're disconnected from God. And that maybe there's a stress that's going on. And, 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 and the one thing I'd want to stress to you, though, is that that idea of God being disconnected couldn't be further from the truth. At Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18, it, this is a wonderfully rich passage. It's going to stretch our thinking a lot. It, it, it works a little bit like one of those beautifully woven and intricately interwoven quilts you see sometimes in Lancaster County. You ever go out that way and you see them? And it's not just that they're patchwork. 
it, it's almost like there's, there's layer upon layer of patchwork with these beautiful threads that run through them. And they're most beautifully designed uh, pieces. And, the, and the, the way this chapter works is a wee bit like that. It, there's layer upon layer of beautiful argument. Not like I'm going to have a fight with you argument, but points that the writer's making argument. And one thread leads into the next. It's very complex in many respects. So today, I'm simply going to sketch out the, the argument, as it were, as we work our way through this passage, uh, verses by verse and, and section by section. But, but, but effectively, what's happening here is that, that each layer of argument builds upon the previous layer um, and, and expands on that. And, and the application, it, it's, we saw this kind of last time, it's in chapter 2, verse 1. It's not that we drift from the Lord Jesus and what we've heard. And actually today, the application especially comes in verse 1 of chapter 3. We're going to look at this in a couple of weeks' time with Pastor Brian. But you see it there, verse 1 of chapter 3. Therefore, holy, that's those who've been set apart, brothers and sisters. The word here is a Delphoi. It means brothers and sisters. Um, it, it, it's um, the brethren, you all, if you're a follower of Jesus. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, and here's the big application, consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. We'll talk about apostle and high priest in a couple of weeks' time, but specifically here, consider the truth about who Jesus is is. He's talking to people who are potentially drifting away from what they know to be true about Jesus, because they're getting a hard time from people for, for following Him. Maybe people even from a Jewish community specifically, and, and here the writer is talking to people from a Jewish background who know Jesus. He's going to use the Jewish Scriptures to make the point about why we need to consider Jesus. And specifically here, consider the Son of God, Jesus, and why He has to die. Uh, the cross of Christ is not a random accident. Many of us will know that it's according to God's plan, but specifically today as we look at this passage and, and see our way through it, we're to consider Jesus in His suffering. And in four different ways. Here are your four headings. Consider the suffering son in his humanity. Consider the suffering son in his solidarity. Uh, thirdly, consider the suffering son in his victory. And then finally, consider the suffering son in his humility. So that's the suffering son in his humanity, his solidarity, his victory, his humility. If you're looking for theological terms to describe all of these things, it's the incarnation, it's his identification, it's liberation, and it's propitiation. So then, uh, the first thing that we're to consider, consider the suffering son in his humanity. Look at verses uh, 5 through to 9 with me. The writer writes, these are God's words, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world, world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? This is the, the Greek version of, 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 the, of, of Psalm 8. We read it a few moments ago. You, you made him for a little while lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So we're to consider the suffering son in his humanity. The focus here is the, the humanity of Jesus, the man, a real live breathing human being, like the person sitting next to you or close in front of you. 
someone with a real personality, with real breath, with a real heartbeat, with real blood pumping through a real live body, real lungs, real organs, real person. Forget the romanticized, westernized, puppy dog, pathetic picture of Jesus. You know the kind of thing I'm talking about? The kind of thing where you see regular people walking through life and Jesus kind of gliding with a kind of a, a glue around him. Put that idea in the trash. Put into trash the idea of a stained glass, remote, disconnected, untouchable Jesus, distant from the real people and the real world. The writer here is making the point that the Son's incarnation is in keeping with the Scriptures. That's why he quotes Psalm 8 here. And in quoting Psalm 8, we recognize that this and the readers of the letter at the first time around would have understood this. Psalm 8 is a beautiful psalm all about creation and specifically humanity's place in this creation because Psalm 8 in turn is based on God's command to Adam and Eve way back in Genesis chapter 1, 28 through 30. Do you remember where God says to have dominion over the earth and everything in that under the authority of God? That's God's design for humanity. And Psalm 8 is celebrating that. And the writer here is celebrating that Jesus is the fulfillment of that in his humanity. Do you hear the connections that are going on here? The whole story of the Bible is all about Jesus. And the writer here is saying that this Jesus is not blah, blah, blah. He's the real man. There is no better man. But, but hang on, some of us might say, you know, didn't we say last time that Jesus is, is, is superior to angels? But here we read that, we're, verse 7, that, you know, he's made a little lower uh, than the angels. What's, what's going on here? Well, actually, it's addressed a little bit further down in verse 9. Because the writer is saying, yes, Jesus in his humanity entered into this world as a real life human being. And for that time on earth, that little while, he was made lower in terms of not status so much as in terms of his humanity, lower than the angels. But now, because he tasted death for us and because God raised him from the dead, he has been crowned with glory and honor. That's the tension that the writer recognizes. We might not see everything subject to Jesus right now, verse 8, but we will in the future when he comes to judge the living and the dead. And we do now see Jesus, verse 9. We see him. We know that he gets what we are about. Why? Because in his humanity, not only does he experience life the way it should be, not only do we see in Jesus, in his incarnation, being a human being, exercising authority over the world in his humanity, over sickness and over nature and over death, over other people's deaths, but we see in Jesus, in his humanity, someone who tastes death himself. Not only is Jesus a better Adam in that sense, he does what Adam doesn't do. He always lives under God's rule, even to the point of dying on a cross. We'll get on to that in a second or two. But, says the writer, consider Jesus. Consider that he is the one who truly gets what it's like to live here. Consider Jesus because he's the one who gets what this world is all about. In all its complex messiness, it's Jesus. And we've already seen how he made everything and how he upholds everything by the power of his word. That's from chapter 1. Now we see here how he's lived it. 
He knows now how life in this world works, not only by design, but by demonstrable experience. He's been here to the point where he tastes death. Now, remember in the context, the writer is speaking to people who are suffering, Christians who are suffering, in a context where society and those who are the great and the good can give these guys a really hard time. But the encouragement here is that we see the one who is truly in control. We see Jesus. He gets it. This, this is not blah, 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 is it? He sees the intricacies of our experience in His humanity. He, he really understands it. He gets what it means to be a human being. Why? Because He is one. Consider the suffering Son in His humanity, says the writer. Second thing is to consider the suffering Son in His solidarity. This is verses 10 through to 13 of Hebrews chapter 2. Read with me. For it was fitting that He, who, that he from whom and by whom all things exist, and bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. Uh, That is why he, he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Now, when we read here that the founder of salvation is made perfect through suffering, he's talking about Jesus being made perfect through suffering. That does not imply that or mean that Jesus was somehow imperfect before he suffered. He he lived a perfect life of obedience to God. The the sense of the word here is that uh, that, uh, Jesus was made perfect complete, or that the work was made complete, or that he was perfectly qualified for the task at hand. Um, He had to take on himself flesh and blood. He had to suffer. He couldn't do that from heaven. He had to become a human being and suffer and die. Uh, That's the sense in which he is made complete or, or made perfect, through suffering. The task is finished. That's the completed work. And we're to consider here the solidarity of the suffering son, because because here we see that, in a sense, verse 11, Jesus and and you and me, we're we're made of the same stuff. Um, You see it, for he who sanctifies, that's Jesus, makes us holy, and those who are sanctified, you and me, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we're, we're all we all have one source. We're all part of the same thing. Uh, that's why, and this is the really cool thing, because you see, not only is Jesus experiencing solidarity with us in terms of the fact he tastes death, and, and we all taste death, but, but also, look at verse 11. Uh, that is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Uh, the word that's used for brother here is the same word that's in verse, chapter 3, verse 1. It's, it's brother or sister, a brethren. The point that's being made here is that this suffering son counts you and I as his family. He calls you and me, if you're trusting in him, sister, brother, and he's not ashamed to say it. This is my family. You know, one of the things I love on Sunday mornings is people bringing their families along and introducing. We had it this morning. Somebody introduced me to their grandfather for the first time, the first time they'd been here. Family. Well, th- th- there's a sense of that here, but here we have the suffering son in his solidarity. The writer is saying, consider him because he looks at you and me and says, here's my brother, here's my sister, and he's not ashamed to do it. He's overjoyed. Who's he introducing us to? God, his father. He's declaring to 
the world God's praise. And he's saying that in verse, I will tell of your name to my brothers, verse 12. And in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. So, so declaring God's name to my brothers and sisters. That's the solidarity that Jesus has with us. And, and he's quoting here from Psalm 22. That psalm itself talks about how the Messiah would be a fellow human being, the brother who would reveal God to people. And of course, that's what Jesus does. Um, and he's not ashamed to call those who believe in him brother, sister. Uh, Isaiah chapter 8, which is the other quotation, makes a similar point. But let's focus on Psalm 22 for a bit longer here, because Psalm 22 is, is really significant. Because remember we talked about this last time, how when the writer quotes from a bit of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, that they're actually saying, yes, make that connection, but also recognize the wider context in which it's been written. So Psalm 8, big creation psalm, all of that sort of stuff. We've done some of that with Genesis chapter 1. Psalm 22 is also spoken in the New Testament by Jesus as he dies on a cross. The first line of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, as he's dying on a cross, says those words. Psalm 22, verse 1. So by connecting with that, the writer is saying that Jesus experiences spiritually that death on a cross. He identifies with the solidarity. He's in solidarity with the, this fallen, sinful, broken messed up world. He gets the reality of our depravity. He's identified with it. Elsewhere in the New Testament, it says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. Why? Verse 10 of our reading. So he could bring you and me to glory. That, that's how much you matter to him. This, this is not blah, 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 is it? A real life human being like the person sitting next to you dies for you and me. And he's not ashamed to call us brother, sister, family. Consider him in his solidarity. A, fourth thing, a third thing to consider is consider the suffering son in his victory. Look at verses 14 through to 16. Since therefore, sorry, we'll do 14 and 15. Uh, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery." Uh, that, that verb there, to deliver, it's the idea of being set free. It has big overtones of, of the Exodus story, and there's a liberating work that Jesus does when he dies on the cross, because that's what's being described in verses 14 and 15. Because here we see um, uh, that how Jesus is actually, and we're going to see this in a couple of weeks' time, Jesus is better than Moses. Uh, through his deliverance out of slavery. But what we see at the cross and what happens at the cross when Jesus dies on the cross is that he breaks the power of the devil, says the writer. He is the one who not only breaks it, he destroys it. The legacy of sin, the reality of our depravity before a holy God is 
dealt with. Now, that might sound like sort of quite high abstract language if you're new to Christian things, but here's the deal. We're all rebels against this God, all of us. The devil is real. The Bible talks about the reality of a real lie, devil, enemy of God, who is dealt with, overcome, and defeated at the cross. Jesus dies. Jesus kills death, spiritual death, the possibility of spiritual death in his death, and he defeats the devil. It takes the Son of God to deal with that. You can't do it. I can't. He can. Consider Jesus, the suffering Son, in his victory. He's won. And we win because he's won. And not only has he defeated the devil, he's overcome the, 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 the grip that sin has on us. He's overcome death itself, spiritual death, and the fear of death that comes with it. Verse 15, this world, we, we live in a world which is just gripped by fear of dying. You want to stop a conversation in mid-sentence, so how are you preparing for your death these days? I mean, try it. No, don't, please. Well, actually, you know what I'm talking about. Because, you know, in those kind of moments of conversation with friends, we just don't bring it up, do we? Think about the number of adverts that we see on TV for medicine. Um, think of the number of people who are going to the gym these days, you know, live longer, living stronger. Why? Because we're terrified of dying. Think of your friends. Woody Allen quipped, it's not that I'm afraid of dying, it's just that I don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> but statistically, one out of one of us dies. But the good news of Christianity is that the Son, in His rising from the dead, liberates us from that fear of death. It doesn't mean that we're not afraid to die, but we're not to be enslaved by it. Why? Because the Son has already experienced death, tasted death, spiritual death for us. This is not blah, 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 blah. Is it? This is life and death stuff we're talking about now. This is talking about happen, what happens to you when you die. Whatever age and stage we are at, that's a huge question that I can't answer for you, but you have to in terms of what God will say to you when you die. And the really good news of Christianity is that God in His Son has done something about it. Which brings us to the final thing to consider about this suffering and the Son and his suffering. We're to consider um, the suffering son in his humanity, in his solidarity, in his victory. And third, fourthly, consider the suffering son in his humility. Uh, verse 16, for surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Just a couple of things to say in relation to this. First is that the sense of he had to in verse 17 there, when it says, you know, he, he, therefore he had to be made like his brothers, um, it, it's, it behooved him. I don't know that word. You know, he was compelled to act in this way. This is the, the sense of inevitability of God's character being displayed in and through his ministry. It shows the humility of Jesus. Why? Verse 16, because he's helping us doesn't help the angels in this kind of a way. He helps real-life people, uh, sons and daughters of Abraham, descendants of Abraham. Remember whom he's talking to, people from a Jewish background who've now believed in Jesus. And those of us who believe the gospel of Christ, we're told, are descendants of Abraham by faith, Romans. 
So, so the point that's being made here is that Jesus is on our side. He's, he, the Son, helps, helps us, you and me. And specifically, therefore, we need to consider how He helps. Well, verse 17, perfect human being, Jesus, the perfect man, the better, the Messiah, uh, no better man, we're told, willingly, humbly, intentionally, will die. Uh, that word propitiation, um, it, it means the, the aversion of God's just wrath his just anger against sin, up onto another. Uh, specifically, it's the just anger, the wrath of God ag against you and me for the way that we've treated God uh, that's being dealt with here. Um, th th that just anger is averted onto the Son. That that's what's happening when Jesus dies. He's taking on himself the wrath of God. So God's just anger isn't just appeased, it's truly satisfied. Now, this idea of propitiation, it, it, it's not popular in some theological circles. It's not popular in some churches today. When we hear the idea of the idea of God being angry with me, we immediately pour into that term um, our preconceived framework of anger don't we? We, we think of a, a bully or a capricious God who threw sun, thunderbolts down on someone or, or some sort of like angry ogre in the sky. And we read all of that into the idea that God is justly angry against the way we rebel, him. Can, uh, rebel against Him. Can I suggest and say to you, if that's your understanding of what you think God is like, put it in the trash. It's not biblical. The idea of God's settled just wrath, His anger is a fact against you and me for the way we treat God. He's the Creator. We are the creation. We act as if it's the other way around. And God in His justice says that we deserve His wrath. God's just anger against you and me, it's a fact. It, it means we will certainly be punished with everlasting destruction. Jesus, the most loving human being who ever walked on this earth, the one who truly gets humanity in a way that you and I simply cannot, He calls it hell. Jesus does. So, if we're questioning the reality of this word propitiation, are we honestly saying that we know better than Jesus when it comes to this issue? He says it's what we deserve. It's where we're headed. Unless someone steps in and takes the punishment instead. And the writer is saying, that's what happens. Jesus saves us from God's anger by taking our sins and therefore deflecting God's anger toward himself. He makes propitiation. And there's another layer of thinking and terminology that's used here. We've alluded to it already. It's the idea of a high priest. This would really have connected with the listeners and the first readers of this letter because they got what a high priest did. Uh, they were a representative before God, a holy God. They made sacrifices. They acted like a go-between, an intermediary, and they were the ones who did the propitiating sacrifice on behalf of the people. And this is what the writer is saying happens when Jesus, who's one of us, acts 
he is that faithful and merciful high priest. He's going to go on and develop how Jesus is a high priest in Hebrews chapter 7 and fulfilling Psalm 110. Uh, it's all kicking off this stuff, isn't it? All these different connections. We'll say more of that when we get there, but the point that's made here is that Jesus, the Son, is the intermediary. He provides the, the, the necessary sacrifice. And what's the sacrifice? Himself. In his death, Jesus is the one who steps in. God pours his own just wrath onto his son. God's holy character is satisfied through the faithful, merciful work of this high priest. His humility is seen in his incarnation, in his suffering, in his death, in the sacrificial work he makes. This is how he helps. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. But not only do we see the humility of the Son who helps us in this kind of a way, we actually see it further still in verse 18. Because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. I defy you to say that you're never tempted. The good news is that you've got someone who can help you through it. The Son, Jesus. It's a wonderful reassurance. Have you ever had that horrible experience, um, maybe a really frustrating experience when you're, you're going through a really hard time? Someone probably really well-meaning says these words, you know what, I know just what it is you're going through, and then proceeds to tell you what they've been through. And the longer they talk, the more evident it is that they have no idea what you are going through at all. Now, we can kind of chuckle about that, but but Hebrews chapter 2, 18 shows us that Jesus really does get it. It's not a trite platitude to say Jesus truly understands what it is you are going through. He's been tempted to, to rebel against God in all of those circumstances, whatever they are, and he is able to deal with that temptation and not to fall because he is perfected through his suffering on the cross. He sticks to God's plan. He is obedient. Consider him who was tempted and is able to help those who are being tempted. Are you tempted today? Tempted in ways that perhaps even if the person sitting next to you knew about them, you'd be absolutely mortified? Jesus knows all about them. And he's able to help you. Will you consider him? Consider him, says the writer. Don't drift from him. This is not blah, 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 is it? This God is not distant. This not God is not detached. This God is real. This God is true. Uh, think about it in these terms. Think about that person next to you. The writer is saying that Jesus is a real human being, just like the person next to you. Real man, real person, real breath, real personality, really gets you. Think about Jesus. Consider Jesus a real person like the person sitting next to you who really dies for you. A real man died for you. God's son, a real man, died for you. Really, truly, dead, killed, murdered, sacrificed, given 
offered for you and me. Will you consider him? says the writer. Consider this Jesus who not only really gets you, who really died for you, who really understands what you're experiencing in life, really knows you truly and sets you free because he knows all about the intricacies of this world and the circumstances you are dealing with and the reality of your depravity and what it is you are dealing with in your life and the struggles you have and is able to help you when you are tempted. And more than that, can set you free. And more than that still, says, he's my sister the brother, and and she's my sister, and they're they're my family. They they belong to me. And he's not ashamed to do that. Will you consider him today? He knows all about you. He truly sets you free. He loves you. He presents you perfect before a holy God. God. Consider this Jesus in his humanity, in his solidarity, in his victory, in his humility. Consider Jesus. There is no better man. Let's pray together. Maybe take a moment to think through what will it mean for me to consider and trust in this suffering Son, Jesus? Gracious Lord, thank you that you know exactly how we are to respond to your word. Please guard us, Lord, from dismissing it or drifting away from it. Please guard us, Lord, from disobeying you. Please help us today to consider Jesus, maybe even for the very first time, and follow him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.